Dr. Hook would be interested in revisiting Barnes Ice Cap. And it's a metaphorical revisit. In 2007, Sneed Hook and Hamilton wrote a paper about Barnes. So it seemed appropriate to revisit. In the intervening 10 years, there's been a lot of work done on the islands in the uh, Canadian Arctic and the ice caps thereupon, and Barnes being one of them. A lot of the work's been done with remote sensing. So as I go back through the literature over the last 10 years, I, I said to Roger, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, it, it, so much really good work's been done in the last decade. I said, but nobody seems to be paying attention to what's happening to the area. So he said, well, let's see if we can figure out how the area is changing. And thereby hangs a tail. Um, so the first thing we did was calculate the, uh, the cherry engine area between 1985 and 2016 using satellite imagery. And if you've ever worked with Roger, life is never really simple or straightforward. <laughs> so in 1977, Gerald Holdsworth published a paper in Nature said that there were five zones that surged um, in the last five or six hundred years. One, two, three, four, five. So Roger said, I wonder if the, the zone, the surging zones are changing differently than the rest of the ice cap. And the answer is yes. Um, uh, next slide. And that's, uh, there's a, in a, a quick and uh, dirty explanation as to what the, how they're changing. Uh, significantly, the other interesting thing is it's been thought that the northeast margin was not changing at all or very, very little, and we found that it has, in fact is changing uh, quite a bit. Uh, the synopsis here at the bottom. It's, uh, we're retreating at about, on average, for the whole ice cap, about 12 and a half meters per year over the last 31 years. Um, one more point. The fascination for me with this place is that it, underneath the top of Barnes is the last remaining bit of the Laurentide ice sheet. And Roger wrote a paper in 1976 demonstrating this. And it's just, we're watching the death of the last dinosaur, the last remnant of the great ice sheet. That's fascinating. That's it. No, it's a work in progress. We got a lot of work to go. Any questions? This is Lance Hammer? Yep. Uh, 85 and uh, 2016. So just two. Oh, a bit more than that. Okay. Clouds. Cool. Thank you. <coughs> oh, I'll introduce you. Our next speaker is Cindy Eisenhower, and she will be talking about shifting accounts and shifted emissions, emission accounting, trade, and the reproduction of international advantage in climate change negotiations. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so very briefly, um, thanks to my co-authors, Aaron Strong, Anna McGinn, and Brian Berry, who's currently studying Kosovo. As many of you know, I've long been interested in emissions accounting frameworks. And you may also know that um, according to the emissions gap report, which was put out last November, we're seeing a pretty significant gap between the um, emissions reductions that have been pledged by the countries and what we need to do in order to avoid um, two degrees of warming or um, to reach that 1.5 target. So a lot of folks have been proposing um, that perhaps if we used alternative accounting methods for emissions that we might be able to increase some of this mitigation gap and in increase the ambition. Um, we're used to seeing figures like this that show emissions um, based either on per capita or in total um, calculated based on production, the production of emissions, so within geopolitical borders. Increasingly, folks have been trying out using world uh, or uh, multi-regional input output analysis, trying out different models for how we calculate emissions. And let me just say this, you know, anthropologists and folks in science and technology studies have been saying for a long time, 
what metrics you use really matter for political power, right? And for negotiations, for fairness, for ethics and for morality. So this is a production-based account. Um, we can also see Davis and Caldera and several other authors have argued that we could use alternatively a consumption-based account where we attribute the emissions based on the end consumer, right? So it uh, preferences demand rather than production. Um, and of course, you can imagine that's not a heavily favored um, emissions accounting scheme by the affluent countries, right, who import a lot of emissions. Other folks have even um, as to, uh, argued that we should be using things like investment, where we can tie the amount of emissions that are generated based on investment, which brings um, uh, more um, light to the idea that money is oftentimes responsible. You can do it based on extraction of carbon um, sources. So there are all sorts of different ways, and they all have very unique political implications. Well, we were really interested in finding out how these different proposals had made their way into UNF C process and whether they not, were or not, particularly considering that scholars and um, academia have now advocated very heavily that if we want to increase our ambition and close that mitigation gap, we need to at least supplement the production-based account to account for international trade, which we're currently not doing, right? We live in a world that's full of international trade. So um, Anna and Aaron and Bree and I did um, a lot of analysis, textual interviews, observations at the UNFCCC process, and essentially found that while um, we're seeing some signs of increased um, influence, uh, we're also seeing uh, the real <coughs> political solidification of the affluent countries who are working very hard not to see this um, creep into the process. Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs> Any questions? That was so brief. <laughs> Anybody questions? Okay, happy to talk after. Next up, we have Danielle Levet talking about mammalian thermal regulation in hot climates, clues for deciphering the past and predicting the future. <clears throat> Thank you. So I realize it's supposed to be a two-minute talk instead of a five-minute talk, I thought. So it's going to be a really brief kind of snippet of a story that I'm slowly working on in my lab and that hopefully you'll see a bit more for the next few years. Uh, so the basics is mammals are supposed to be endotherms, so they have constant elevated body temperatures. But there's a huge amount of variability in how that works. So you have some species that live at body temperature of around 30 degrees, and then the some like the fine squirrels that are closer to around 38. And you get weird things in between. Um, and the way we classify, usually people thought that mammals have this high and constant body temperature, but now we're starting to recognize the variability and look at it more as a sort of level, which is the slide here showing all the different the kind of mean <coughs> temperature that they use when they're active, and then the variability around that temperature that varies a lot between different species. And what you get in the northern hemisphere is either you get species that are mostly on all the time or off during periods of hibernation, and in the tropics you get all sorts of weird everything in between. So during my PhD, I worked on these weird guys, uh, greater hedgehog tenrex. So tenrex are closely related to elephants. They rafted over to Madagascar at one point, and now they look like hedgehogs. Um, and uh, they have these really low body temperatures that are kind of all over the place. But they also live in an environment where ambient temperatures are consistently higher than their body temperature. And so they don't have to spend any energy to thermoregulate. So they're at the sort of low, slow end of the mammal spectrum and how they work. So I was interested in, in the sort of upper, faster end of this thing, so I did my postdoc work on, sorry, we'll ignore that, on um, tree shrews in Borneo. So tree shrews are, have always been in the tropics and stayed in the tropics. They have nice big brains and they're super neurotic and active during the day, running around. And they have really, really high body temperatures, so active temperatures of around 40 degrees, which would kill us, uh, and then these sort of low body temperatures at night. Um, and similar to the graph I showed earlier, but now it's flipped, where you have active during the day and resting at night, and the kind of variability there. So these are sort of two sides of the mammal spectrum, and there's all sorts of things in between. And so what I'm hoping to show over the next few years is the uh, effects of different kind of climates on all of these different strategies, and which ones are going to do better or worse as things start to warm. So I'll use my last two seconds to do a little bit of a preview. I'm teaching a grad seminar on thermal ecology, which might be of interest to some people. So that'll be in the fall. Thank you.
right, our next presenter is Ivan Fernandez speaking about science and scientists in ongoing support for the U.S. Clean Air Act. Thank you. Well, good uh, morning. Um, and I couldn't help but uh, take the opportunity to take like two minutes of fame at the, the 2018 Bourne Symposium. Uh, to talk about the Science Advisory Board, it's not every year that the New York Times and every other periodical uh, advertises uh, some of the work that you're doing, and uh, many of you have been aware of uh, some of the politics around Science Advisory Boards. Uh, so I, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, uh, what that activity uh, is about. I've been involved with Science Advisory, EPA, the Science Advisory Board, for uh, about 20 years in various panels uh, and committees. Uh, and uh, currently I'm uh, on the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, which is kind of the, uh, the committee that o oversees uh, the Clean Air Act specifically. Uh, and it has various panels. One of the panels is the Secondary National Ambient Air Quality Standards Review Panel for Oxides of Nitrogen and Sulfur. And there are these panels for both primary and secondary effects. Primary is human health. Uh, secondary is ecological uh, uh, impacts, um, and they would have made a big mistake if they put me on the primary uh, review panel. Uh, and the, the um, various panels review uh, the work products of EPA scientists in evaluating various aspects of the science that supports uh, environmental law. Uh, the process uh, is uh, about a three to five year process. Uh, each time that the review takes place, it takes place roughly about every uh, 10 years. Uh, it's a four-step process, which uh, integrated review, a very comprehensive science assessment, risk and exposure assessment, and then follow, finally the policy assessment. Uh, each one of those represents a work product of the agency and agency scientists that then is handed off to the uh, science advisory board, which are external scientists, in order to evaluate it. And uh, these panels, we have a lot of authority. So they uh, are really uh, uh, sort of nervous about what our evaluations are, and they respond to all of them. Um, that ends up then going to uh, the agency to develop a, a proposed decision on the standards, which may be increase the, the standard, reduce the standard, or just leave it alone. Um, and then that finally goes to uh, the EPA administrator. Uh, I suspect everyone in the room knows that the current administrator is uh, uh, Administrator Pruitt. Uh, the Science Advisory Board is an office in the Administrator's um, uh, office, uh, but uh, operates uh, completely independently. And so, uh, you know, the Clean Air Act is not a static uh, law that was passed in the 70s and uh, it takes care of itself. You know, the corny metaphor would be uh, it's like a garden that needs to be tended. Uh, and the science is really important, regardless of, uh, of uh, what the politics are, because uh, that's what future uh, litigation or future policy will be based on. So I encourage all of you to participate in those activities when you can. And I got the clamshell. Thank you. <laughs> Any quick questions? Next we have Fran Schwank doing her research on um, anthropogenic trace elements emissions in West Africa. So this, this data is from Mount Jones Ice Core. I worked in this ice core from APAG, and I still have a lot of both data, so I kind of play with the data I still have now. And I come up with this idea, and it's just a, I say a preliminary work, I still work on the data, I need to do a lot of things there, and I will just show you what I have. So, I work with these four elements, smooth, uh, cadmium, chromium, and lead. They are from natural and anthropogenic sources. And the problem about these elements is they, um, these elements are, they are toxic in any level for the health. So, they are really bad for environment. Uh, here, uh, I have this graphic is uh, the mean concentration for the elements, the Mount Jones I score for these four elements. I have uh, my uh, estimative of the, the sources contribute for this concentration. And the yellow, I have all the excess concentration. So we interpreted this yellow like, uh, we, we interpreted this yellow uh, how 
interpretation that's um, what other word. So for us, this is like anthropogenic contribution for these concentrations. Uh, here I have the Kustawa Hicksement factors. They are high, so they kind of means we have a mixed sources for these concentrations. Here I have the principal components analysis, so I show the relation between these three elements and bismuth here in the separate component. So makes sense if bismuth is not with them because here we have more vulcan contribution thing for these three elements. So when I put a metal, concentra uh, metal concentration in my data against metal production in the sort hemisphere, we can see a kind of relations. So we see when I have like high production of a bismuth, I kind of have a high concentration. And when I have like low, I have this low here. I kind of should try to understand what happened here in the first part of both of my records. Um, of course, I need to look for other kind of sources too, not just for the mine sources and show open work. So more data will come some moment. And here I have the high split strike pass model for my score. Monjo's score is here. And I have, we need to keep in mind these elements stay in the atmosphere for like between 10 and 12 days is the time, is the time the transport occur between the continents. And here I have 10 days backwards trajectories for show how they are arriving my, in my site in Antarctica. So because that, because that I kind of think Africa is not a big influence for them, because Africa is around here. And make more sense, they come from like South America and <coughs> Australia is around here. And yeah, it's that. <laughs> I still work on this data. <laughs> so thank you. Oh, yeah. So can you, I'm just curious, can you talk a little bit more about the trajectory model and how you oh, yeah. determine those percentages? I just don't this, understand that. They are clustered. Uh, I did the daily trajectory for since 1979 to 2015. So I got, sorry, I got uh, around 3,000 trajectories, this one per day. And after I cluster all day in, this, in these lines here. So this is like 30% of these 3,000 here. So the cluster try put together, the trajectories are similar. So just for show. I did, for, I did just five, but when I do five, the lines get shorter and I kind of want to see they coming from the continent. So each time I, I make less clusters, the line will be shorter because they are making average of these trajectories together. So ideally, if I put just one day trajectory, they will be longer than appear here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shaw speaking about an overhead or low overhead scalable data collection service. Thanks. All right, so as uh, some of you might know, I uh, spend most of my time with uh, CCI working on the P301 project. Well, actually, Mark, Mark does all of the work, and I kind of nod my head. But this is more like a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a side project, so it's a really small project um, that I started doing uh, on the side. So it's, it's maybe good for a two-minute talk, I thought. So, um, so the basic problem is, uh, suppose we're designing, uh, we're designing some application where we would like someone to be able, a, a large group of people, distributed geographically to be able to upload some data. So an example might be something like a bird count, uh, some sort of citizen science initiative where you have some app and you, you're hoping people all over the country or maybe even all over the world might get into it and start uploading data. Uh, one problem with such, a th uh, such an initiative is that it's hard to predict how many people are actually going to participate in many cases. So we might hope that we, uh, you know, we get some really good news coverage and we get uh, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of participants. On the other hand, if you know the weather is bad and there are other things to do or something, eh, we might just get training. So, so the thing is, how do we how do we budget for this in terms of uh, building a system? And 
as some of you know, I mean, uh, uploading data is a lot more complicated than downloading. So, you know, you visit a website, you, you get some stuff from there. We know how to do that really efficiently. You know, you've got all sorts of technologies to do that. Uploading stuff at the same time or close together in time is very difficult. So there's a few options. Uh, you know, it's not like people haven't thought about this before. You could run your own server. You could use some web hosting services. You can use something from Amazon, like Elastic Computing. And actually, we've done that in uh, a few years ago in the Ten Green project, and uh, that's that's the going on. And you know, it works pretty well, except that uh, it doesn't scale as much as I would really like it to scale. So my demands uh, are that if nobody is using it, which of course will never happen, but just in case it happens, if nobody is using it. We want the cost to be zero, and uh, the thing is, uh, you know, when you use something like Elastic Computing, it's sort of like the utility. You know, so even if you don't use any electricity a particular month, uh, Imera is still going to send me a bill for customer charge and things like that. So I, I, I just want it to be zero, and I want it to scale linearly or better than linearly as much as possible. So, so there's some there's some recent opportunities. So there's what's called serverless computing. I mean, there's a lot of jargon here, but when we say serverless, this is to be distinguished from the fact where you have a virtual server. So there's a lot of people who are running virtual servers. The idea of serverless is that there's absolutely nothing that has been provisioned for you or for your service, and some event occurs, and that leads to something being provisioned, and then the actual work being done, and then it being deprovisioned, uh, and this all has to happen within a uh, fraction of a second. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how that works, uh, but luckily for us, you know, Amazon uh, has uh, such a service. Uh, but what's the catch, right? So there's got to be a catch. So the catch is when you use this stuff, you are forced to program or to design your system at a very primitive level. I mean, there's a complete lack of standards. Everything is vendor specific right now. And of course, you know, Amazon would like us all to do it their way. Uh, what happens when Amazon decides to? change it well then you got to change how you're doing stuff or what if uh, you know like the prime membership they keep they keep turning the dial a little bit every year i say that as i'm getting ready to pay 110 dollars for my prime membership so so we we want we want stuff to be uh, standards based so so there's there's not a vendor lock in because there's a lot of disadvantages for that so uh, again i'm not going to go into details it's a it's a 2 minute talk but one of the challenges is that how do you how do you build a system where uh, essentially, it's like you're back to the early days of computing. Uh, you don't even have things like databases and stuff like that. You just have little pieces of uh, space where you can store small amounts of data with all sorts of restrictions and things like that. And that's, of course, why it's so inexpensive and why they can do it. Uh, so, they, so from a programming point of view, it opens up a lot of opportunities. Uh, so, okay. So, in summary, what I'm uh, focusing on in terms of the application is uh, essentially a data collection service where you imagine you are doing some citizen science initiative and you're expecting maybe a few hundred people to participate from around the state of Maine or something, but then uh, someone picks up the story and suddenly everyone wants to participate. And uh, what ends up happening most of the time when something like that happens is the system crashes. So then basically, uh, instead of thousands of people participating, suddenly you have zero people participating. And this is, uh, this is a known problem, so there are some solutions for that. But the solutions are not quite as good enough as I'm hoping they would be. So, so I'd really like the uh, the cost to scale linearly or or better than linearly. We say, how can it scale better than linearly? Well, because you know Amazon cuts you a discount after a while. So, so you, you can actually do that. Uh, and the challenges are, of course, what is a reasonable programming model? Because it's very easy to build this. I mean, if you tell me to build this, you know, I can have something running for you by next week, easy. But but two months from now. I'll have to go and change it because oh Amazon changed something or something is do, is done differently now and you know I don't have the time or patience to keep babysitting it so so how do you design it in a way that's long term standards based uh, so okay I think I will stop there and take questions. I've been reading a lot about Bitcoin and blockchain recently, and I wondered if you could speak at all to the energy implications of this type of distributed computing. Would, we, would it have more of an energy impact and therefore a climate impact? Yes, uh, but uh, first of all, I mean, it's kind of related to what I'm talking about, but really it's very different. Okay. But but I'm glad, I'm glad to talk about it because I, I do, I do uh, study the blockchain and stuff like that. Yeah, Bitcoin as a first approximation is pretty much a scam. <laughs> so if you've got Bitcoin, sell now. Uh, 
you know, if you if you bought it, uh, if you bought it in, uh, you know, five six years ago, then uh, sell that's now, great. Rich. But, but sell now anyway, yeah, and give me some. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean it's true. I mean Bitcoin. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about it. You know, so so Bitcoin is basically blockchain technology. They use what's called proof of work as a way to prevent uh, counterfeiting. So uh, a simple way to describe it is that if I want to add something to the system, I have to do a certain amount of work that's computationally expensive. And um, in, we don't have an actual mathematical proof for it, but there's uh, something just a, a slight bit short of that. So basically, there, there's very strong reasons to believe that even the NSA or someone with those kind of resources cannot do this work faster than a certain rate. And so that gives us a certain physical barrier, which then allows us to design the system such that people cannot make changes uh, once some data has been committed. So it's a very secure system, um, but it uses up a lot of energy because doing work, work computational work requires energy. Uh, there are alternatives though. The, the, the other alternatives which a lot of businesses like, of course, is proof of stake, which is that uh, if, if you own more coin, uh, we're going to listen to you more, uh, which is, you know, I think uh, we can say a lot about what that tells us about society and so on. But Mark is telling me to plan it, so I'll stop you. <laughs> Thank you. Nope. We're going to jump ahead because her program um, is not the correct one. So we're going to jump ahead to James Fasto speaking about glaciation on Mercury flow of ice and permanently shadowed surface polar craters. Thank you for jumping ahead. Well, I'm coming very much out of left field here. Um, I've, I've been working mainly on Mars lately, but uh, my colleague uh, Jim Head at Brown asked me how fast are the glaciers flowing on Mercury. I said glaciers on Mercury. Um, and the, um, the, the thing about Mercury is the uh, Mercury has very little tilt, and so the light at uh, the sunlight at the poles is coming in horizontally. And the deep craters at the uh, at the pole are in permanent shadow, uh, and so the the blues here are are areas where uh, in permanent shadow, the uh, uh, red are areas that are uh, observed to be radar bright from uh, Arecibo, and uh, uh, <coughs> you can see the areas kind of overlap. Uh, the, the permanent shadow corresponds to the to the radar bright. Uh, in in answering this question about how fast the glaciers were flowing, I assumed the largest glaciers that you could get on Mercury, which is uh, filling the crater to the uh, the shadow line, uh, the, the permanent shadow terminator. Uh, I built a uh, set of synthetic craters from uh, various parameterizations of crater depth versus width, uh, rim height, uh, slope, and so forth. So I built this kind of virtual crater uh, that I could then use in my ice sheet model. This is a picture of what uh, they look like, uh, depth, thickness, and uh, surface. And when I initially ran this, the, uh, the velocities I got were 10 to the minus 8 meters per year, not very much. Um, uh, but it occurred to me that the uh, heat from the surrounding hot terrain uh, could conduct through the rock and uh, uh, deliver a greater amount of geothermal flux to the base of these uh, ice-filled craters. Uh, so here's a cold spot on the surface surrounded by warm terrain. And you can see it depresses the isotherms underneath that cold spot and heat flows down the temperature gradient. So this is gonna draw heat in from the side uh, 
and deliver this pattern of heat to the base of, of the uh, cold crater uh, with a nominal 50 coming in at the bottom in the middle of the crater at 75 and at the edges it's up almost to 200 milliwatts per meter squared. And this, this, this is a more extreme effect for small craters because the contribution of heat from the left and the right kind of overlaps. So small craters get a lot of heat. Uh, so I ran a whole bunch of different cases. These are uh, crater di diameter versus latitude. Uh, this is the uniform heat case flux where I'm getting them 10 to the minus eight meters. Uh, and with the lateral heat conduction, uh, I'm getting uh, 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus one, and actually 10 to the zero in the smaller high latitude craters. Uh, these, this is basal temperature without the uh, lateral heat conduction. This is basal temperature with uh, uh, increase in, in uh, temperature at the bed. And actually we see here, a few tiny little cases here, up oh, out of time. All right, so now we'll hear from Ellen Enderlin about high resolution satellite observations of Columbia Glacier, Alaska, reveal shifting controls on mass loss during retreat. So I figured you guys didn't want to hear the same stuff that I talked about in 2016 because that's what actually was loaded before. Um, so this is some work I've been doing on Columbia Glacier, which is in Alaska. Um, the paper that I wrote up for this work is actually in review right now. Hopefully it will be published pretty soon. Um, so I'm looking at Columbia Glacier, which is right here. Um, it is a very large marine terminating glacier. It is one of the largest glaciers in Alaska. It pumps out a tremendous volume of ice into the ocean. And it is considered the archetype of a tidewater glacier going through a retreat cycle. So these retreat cycles are often thought of as totally independent of climate change. And it's driven by variations in the geometry of the fjord as the glacier retreats. So I have this figure shown here. This is the glacier retreat from basically the 1950s all the way through this long fjord here up to present. And these pink colors are actually separated into two tributaries. And I should show this as a video now. So where it was stable out here on this, uh, at the end here, this was actually on a shoal where the water was really shallow. You can see it rapidly retreats through this fjord here where the water depth increases. It sort of stabilizes temporarily here where the fjord has a constriction. And then it takes off again once it gets past that constriction. So this is considered to be pretty much primarily controlled by geometry. Climate shouldn't really matter. But when we start thinking about this, there has to be some climate change signal imprinted on this. So I started looking at recent terminus change for the two tributaries, which is shown here. So glaciers are both getting shorter, but you can see at quite different rates. And then you can see for the larger glacier, which I still call Columbia, there's a seasonal signal superimposed. And that corresponds with these seasonal variations in speed as well. So I looked at this and said, all right, if terminus retreat is driving long-term acceleration of the glacier, then should seasonal retreat due to climate factors be driving seasonal acceleration? And it turns out, no, those two things aren't actually related. So what we actually see here is that we have these huge changes in speed, and these are related to changes in air temperature. And what's happening is we have meltwater that's forming on the surface of the glacier. It gets evacuated to the base of the glacier. That causes the glacier to be hydraulically jacked off of the bed, and it slides along really quickly. So it goes really, really fast here in the spring when we first have meltwater hitting the glacier base. And then as that water gets more and more at the base of the glacier, we start to have like essentially a river system form beneath the glacier. And the glacier slumps back down, it contacts the base, and it slows down. 
you can see it goes from about eight meters per day down to about one meter per day in the summer. And so what we see is that if we use our surface observations and we invert for changes in the basal drag or the basal friction, we can see that there's a reorganization of the subglacial drainage network. So in these plots, these are in the spring when the glacier is flowing really quickly. There's all this blue here in the middle that shows you that essentially the ice is not in contact with the base. There's no friction provided at the base. But then if we look here in the fall when we're at our minimum speeds, we see that there's a lot of friction everywhere. So the glacier has slumped back down and this contact with the base, there's a lot of friction. This is really interesting because it tells us that really changes in terminus position over short time scales don't really matter. Glacier doesn't care that much about them. It's only when we have these longer uh, several year changes that we see down here, these are cross sections of the glacier now. See that the glacier, it had seasonal changes, but it didn't, didn't really care until it retreated over this little bedrock bump into this deep trough and it rapidly accelerated. And the same thing is going on here with this other branch as well. It retreated from a pinning point where it was stable into a deep section in the fjord and now it's accelerating. So this tells us that we should see that there are changes in uh, glacial behavior due to environmental change, even when a glacier is retreating, um, but it might not be exactly as straightforward as the glacier retreats and speeds up. And that is all I have, I believe. We'll take questions, thanks. Next up, we have Brandon Hall speaking about rapid deglaciation in Eastern Maine. Thank you. All right, thank you. So Ali Balter yesterday gave a good introduction to Heinrich Stadial One, this period between about 14,700 years ago and 17,500 years ago. And we're interested in this period because it's iconically thought to be this bitterly cold period around the North Atlantic region, but there have been emerging data that suggests that summers might have been warm during this time period. And if so, that would point to extreme seasonality during this time period which coincides with the start of the termination of the Ice Age. As Ali mentioned yesterday, we're doing work on glaciers around the North Atlantic region as a way to track climate warming during this time period. And she showed data that she and Gordon have from Scotland, and today I'll show some preliminary data that we have from Maine. So during the last glacial maximum, ice extended out onto the outer banks in the Gulf of Maine and began to retreat back Towards the coast, um, the exact time of that is not well known, but the marine dates that are out there suggest that this certainly was underway by 17,000 years ago, which would fall in that Heinrich Stadia 1 time period. Our goal is to look at the retreat of that ice once it reached land and to do a transect um, from the present day coast inland to try to track how that retreat occurred over time. And we'll do this using surface exposure age dates of boulders that are perched on some of the summits. And so we're doing elevation transects from the summits down uh, to uh, as close to sea level as we can get while still being above the marine limit, which we need to be for exposure age dating. And we're also doing a transect inland from the coast. Uh, these are a couple of our initial tra uh, elevation transects for Mount Desert Island and also Scooting Mountain just to the north. In both of these instances, oops, back up here. Both of these instances, the summits emerged around 15,800 years ago, and the deglacial, the deglacial thinning proceeded very rapidly, um, certainly all within a thousand years and really within the limitations of our dating. Uh, if you go farther north, Pineo Ridge we dated, and I don't have time to go into this, but we were able to date this to about 15,300 years ago, further to the north. And if you look at a bunch of our sites now, um, again, Mount Desert Island, Skudik Mountain emerged from the ice around 15,800 years ago. Pineo Ridge dates to about 15,300 years ago. 
And we have another site about 50 kilometers to the north where we're getting a very similar age. And so it appears to us that this whole area of eastern Maine cleared out in a very short time period um, towards the middle and end of Heinrich Stadium 1. We also have um, an older date down here on Isle of Ho, but we're not yet certain if it is correct because it's a single age. So just to conclude then, um, the evidence from the Continental Shelf, the marine date, seemed to suggest that deglaciation was in fact underway in the Gulf of Maine during the early part of Heinrich Stadium 1, and that this deglaciation continued when the ice uh, reached the present coast, and much of eastern Maine was deglaciated between about 15 and 16,000 years ago. Thank you. We finished with the two minute talks and are moving on to a couple longer ones. Um, starting off with Caitlin McDonough McKenzie speaking about conservation paleobiology above tree line in the northeastern United States. Thank you. Um, so I'm a postdoc in Jacqueline Gill's lab, and I just started this project in September. So this will be a lot of context and motivation and some nice field photos. Uh, so to start with some context about why we want to combine paleobiology and conservation, this is from a big review that came out in science last year. In most landscapes, maximizing conservation success will require more integration of paleobiology and conservation biology, because in a rapidly changing world, a long-term perspective is necessary to specify and select appropriate conservation targets and plans. And so while that's true globally, uh, living in the Northeast and enjoying the mountains, I started thinking a lot about conservation paleobiology for alpine and subalpine habitats. So what does that mean for communities and sites that have been well protected for the most of the 20th century? Uh, in Maine, we're really good at sticking national forests and national parks and state parks and NGO lands on top of our mountains. So they've been protected. And what does it mean to look at conservation paleobiology for these natural communities that are isolated, their small populations are at the southern edge of their ranges. So what does it mean for alpine and subalpine plant species that are isolated not just by their geographic locations on these islands of habitat, but they're also isolated by those different management groups that are working above tree line across Maine. So not only do we need a paleobiology perspective, but we also need to be able to bring this perspective to a wide range of managers who have different conservation ethics and goals and mandates. And so that's why we found ourselves standing in the middle of Sargent Mountain Pond in September, because this pond sits at Treeline, currently in Acadia National Park. And we're really interested in understanding how the future of alpine and subalpine plant communities, and in Acadia where Treeline is so short and the mountains are so short, what can we expect for those open mountaintops looking into the future? And if we can look into the past and understand how the vegetation communities at this site have changed over time in response to past climactic changes, maybe we can better predict and assess the vulnerability of these sites in the future. And when we use paleobiology, uh, we can get really good spatial and temporal patterns to look across the landscape, especially at low elevation. So in this example, um, we're looking at changing densities of spruce pollen across the Northeast. And we can do that because each of those dots represents a site where someone has taken a sediment core and counted pollen. And so we have great spatial coverage and excellent temporal coverage, and we can look at how things have changed through time and across space. That gets a little bit more difficult when you're trying to do this at higher elevations, because when I went into the literature review to look at uh, the, conserva or the paleobiology studies that had happened in the mountains in the Northeast, it's a really thin literature review. And if you have any papers or leads on this, please let me know. <laughs> but currently, uh, in the Adirondacks, Jackson and Whitehead looked at six um, alpine and subalpine uh, ponds across an elevation gradient in the late 80s and early 90s. Spear Davis and Shane did the same in the White Mountains for eight different sites or eight different ponds up to the lakes of the clouds here on top of Mount Washington. Um, 
And then in Maine, it's a little bit more sparse. So there's one site in Baxter State Park that Anderson looked at, uh, Upper South Branch Pond, which is not actually a subalpine pond at all, but it is in Baxter. Uh, so I use that as justification for being able to core in Baxter again. And then uh, recently, Norton looked at um, Sargent Mountain Pond, but they only worked up the pollen through about 9,800 years ago. So we're not sure what's happened in the pollen record um, over the last 9,000 years. And while this is great that there has been some of this work, and some of it has actually um, produced um, uh, results that people have used for conservation paleobiology. So for example, uh, this is a um, figure that Spear, Davis, and Shane put together where each of these triangles represents the iconic white or any white mountain um, from elevation at uh, sea level up to the top of Mount Washington. And as the triangles move through time, they put together the vegetation communities that they saw from the pollen records and from macro fossils at their sites. And you can see the shrub tundra all the way down, uh, moving into a spruce woodland and spruce woodland, and more species start filling in. Um, but at the top, the shrub tundra remains the same, and they found no evidence for a closed canopy at uh, Lakes of the Clouds over the course of their paleo records. And so that, um, that lack of evidence for a closed canopy led to um, this recent report on climate change and biodiversity in Maine using that paleo data to say that although alpine habitat islands is uh, smaller than Mount Katahdin may be lost, the persistence of alpine communities during a warming period 5,000 years ago suggests that many alpine plant habitats may persist through the end of this century. And so uh, paleo, conservation paleobiology is already being used to inform climate change vulnerability assessments, but these um, uh, sources for using this uh, kind of data in Maine means that there's a lot of opportunities for doing conservation paleobiology right here in Maine. And so um, we wanted to be able to fill in those gaps and to understand if what's happening on top of the lakes, of, on top of lakes of the clouds, actually makes sense in Maine, where Katahdin is about the elevation of lakes of the clouds hut. It's at a high, it's at a more northern latitude. Um, but a lot of the alpine and subalpine areas in Maine are at much lower elevations, including Acadia National Park. So we cored two lakes. Um, we worked in Acadia at Sargent Mountain Pond and in Baxter at Chimney Pond. And the rest of this talk is just beautiful photos from that field work. So in September, we were on Sargent Mountain Pond. We had uh, a raft that we carried up there to collect uh, sediment cores. We got about four meters of sediment from two uh, or two cores that are four meters long each. Um, this is a remote site and it was tough to get a boat in there. And luckily the Sierra Club and Friends of Acadia National Park volunteered to help us out. So this is carrying in the pieces of our boat uh, up the Deerbrook Trail. It was pretty burly. And then this was the first core that we got. And we had the most beautiful Acadia fall weather for the week that we were there. It was perfect for swimming and coring and boating around up there. And then in March, we were in um, Baxter State Park coring at Chimney Pond. And coring in the winter means you don't need to worry about carrying in a boat. So we ice augered through about three feet of ice on the pond and then cored through the ice. Um, and we were working with the folks at Baxter and they were incredibly generous with their time and energy and helped us to um, carry all of our equipment in and out. So they snowmobiled all of our coring equipment in and then we wrapped up our beautiful cores in sleeping bags and put them on a sled and they got snowmobiled out, out uh, nice and cozy. And uh, at the end of March, I took these cores to the lab core facility at uh, University of Minnesota to split them and do initial core descriptions. There's a lot of macro fossils. These are all macro fossils from some of the cores. So we're going to get some good dates from these. Um, and our next steps are to start processing um, and counting pollen. So for the rest of my fellowship, I'll be indoors at a microscope thinking about the beautiful places um, that these um, pollen cores represent and how we can help the conservation managers who are working there to better predict how vulnerable these sites and species and communities might be to climate change. So thank you.
And finally, we have Jasmine Saro speaking about the Hangar Muskwak International Research Network. Yep. Yeah. Close enough. Close enough. Okay. Probably I won't do it again. Uh, so I thought I'd talk about something a little bit different this year and tell you about some work that we've been doing as part of a working group that I co-founded a few years ago. And Robert, Rachel, and Ben are part of this group, as well as about 24 other people as well. And the group is focused on trying to assess climate-driven change across an Arctic landscape, specifically across this region of West Greenland around Kangaroo Swack. So we call ourselves the Kangaroo Swack International Research Network. And so as I said, there's, there's about 28 of us in the group, come from seven different countries at this point, and um, a variety of institutions. And this group really formed um, just, you know, we, we basically started talking to people that we knew who had been working in this area and looked for people who might be interested in collaborating on a multidisciplinary sort of project. And that led us to host a workshop where we invited several people to come and think about how could we look at climate-driven change across this landscape and try to integrate across the system and see what's happening here. So we had one workshop in the UK a few years ago, a second one in Maine a couple years ago, and then last year we were in Norway. So I can tell you a bit about some of the different products that we've had as part of this group. And um, these are just some of the members of the group. So you can see we have um, people from sort of all career stages in the group here. And we have people working on a number of different uh, aspects of the landscape here. And so this shows you sort of the layout of the landscape. So we're looking at the um, Greenland ice sheet and then glacial outwash plains that produce dust, the terrestrial system that has shrubs um, as well as caribou and musk oxen. And then there are many lakes across the landscape here as well. So we have people working on physical, chemical, and biological components of those lakes. Um, and I should mention um, for the, the glacial group, people are looking at the rate of discharge as well as the chemistry of that discharge. So a multidisciplinary sort of group looking across this landscape and focusing on um, responses across key components of the system here. And so one of the first products that came out of this group was a paper in bioscience. It's a synthesis paper that essentially integrates what we know across this landscape and thinking about how um, the system has been changing um, during the 20th century and what sorts of changes we might expect to see over the next 100 years. So that's partly what's depicted in this conceptual sort of diagram here thinking about some of the changes we might anticipate here. And thinking about some of the linkages across the, the system and how those might change as well. So, um, from our second workshop, there were a couple different products. Robert produced a, um, a meeting report in EOS that describes some of the activities of the working group. And then um, we came up with the idea of putting out a special issue of Arctic, Antarctic, and Alpine research. So that issue actually is uh, just coming out now. It's an open access issue, so you can download any of the articles. And it's not just limited to those who are uh, part of the research network. But many of these articles are out now, and, and uh, more and more are coming out each day. So we have about 22 articles total in this special issue. And so our last workshop, we decided to focus on abrupt changes and whether we had the data as a group to start thinking about abrupt changes in this landscape, um, what kinds of abrupt changes are there, and how, what kind of environmental responses might we be seeing. And so we used breakpoint analysis of different time series to identify significant nonlinear changes in climate and environmental response across the system. And so we started by looking at the Greenland blocking index. So it's an appropriate index, I think, to use for um, thinking about Greenland and climate here. It describes the atmospheric high pressure region that forms over Greenland. 
You can look at it on an annual basis, which is what is shown in the top series here. Um, so Edward Hanna produced this going back to 1850. You can also look at it in seasonal slices as well. So the lower one that I'm showing you here is for summer. We looked at all of the seasons. And where we saw some significant changes, uh, again, nonlinear sorts of changes identified by this breakpoint analysis, where some in the late 1800s, early 1900s, in both of these series. But after that, we didn't see changes until 1994 in the annual GBI and 2006 in the summer GBI. And so this led us to ask some questions about whether the climate of the continental interior of West Greenland was shifting with these recent nonlinear increases in the GBI. And if so, have we seen rapid environmental and biological responses across this landscape? So starting with the climate, so the top series here is showing you, again, the annual GBI and the breakpoints that were identified there. And then we looked at weather station data from the Kangaroo-Liswak area. So temperature, air temperatures actually go back to the 1940s and precip only to 1973. And we looked at this on an annual basis as well as um, by months and by seasons. And one of the significant changes that we see that's coherent with the shift in the annual GBI is a change in mean June temperatures. There's actually a 2.2 degrees Celsius increase right around the same time as the shift in the annual GBI. And we also see a change in winter precipitation at the same time. It's a doubling, although keep in mind that we're talking about a doubling from 20 to 44 millimeters. Okay, so I realize that that's uh, some different context, I guess, for, compared to here, but, um, but we do see a doubling there. So right around this uh, 1994 time period, we did see some nonlinear changes occurring. And we refer to this as the winter spring break point because we're seeing significant temperature changes in the time period, June, where you get that transition really um, into spring, summer um, in, the, in this area of the Arctic and then the change in winter precipitation there. And then with the summer GBI, with that break point around 2006, we do see a significant increase in mean July temperatures at the same time based on the weather station data. There is quite a bit of variability in mean July temperatures prior to that, but this is a significant shift in mean July temperatures. So we identified what we were calling a winter spring break point around 1994, and then a summer break point around 2006. And so this led us then to look at some different time series of environmental responses, and this is just a subset of some of those responses. We have discharge from the Greenland ice sheet shown on top, and dust, lake ice out, and plant phenology, which is the date of 50% leaf emergence um, across different species of shrubs. And I've blocked out the time frame of the winter spring break point. So it's 1994 plus or minus the confidence interval on it. And then the summer break point here, again, a bar for that showing the, the um, confidence interval. And you can see some interesting environmental changes that occurred with these break points. There was a, um, an increase in discharge from the Greenland ice sheet. And that's actually been found in a number of areas. Um, and then the dust record is a combination of a paleo record, as well as in red here, an instrumental record. And we do see an increase in dust production in this region as well. Lake ice out shifted with the winter break point, as you might expect, to six days earlier at that time. And plant phenology, we saw um, actually two shifts to earlier um, timing here for, for this metric. So I can talk a little bit more about the ice out since I really shouldn't talk about the other things as a lake ecologist. Um, and this is what I know the best. So I thought I'd just tell you a bit more about some of the changes that we've been seeing in lakes um, with this break point. So again, this is the, the um, ice out record and I will say um, I was able to put together this ice out record with Gordon Hamilton's help. He helped me fill in a lot of the gaps with satellite imagery. 
So again, we're seeing this um, shift to earlier ice out here. And with that, um, this is just some simple t-test analyses that are looking at, actually if I back up here, thinking about pre versus post. And um, so this is log of post minus the pre here. So if we're going positive, um, we're seeing an increase um, after this shift in ice out. And if the red error bars do not cross over zero, we've got a significant change between those two time frames. And what we see is that surface water is warmed after the, the shift in um, ice out. And we're seeing clearer waters in these lakes too, as indicated by an increase in the water clarity measured by SecuDisc transparency, but also a number of metrics that contribute ultimately to that clarity, that being um, a decline in DOC and a decline in total phosphorus. Both of those things can ultimately contribute to increase in water transparency. As Kate talked about earlier, we actually see some pretty tight coupling of the timing of ice out and thermal stratification patterns in these Arctic lakes. Unlike what we see in Maine lakes, that link is not so strong, I should just say in Maine lakes, as Kate <coughs> was pointing out. Um, but here in the Arctic, what we see is that in years with earlier ice out, we tend to get much deeper mixing in lakes over the course of the summer. Um, compared to years where the ice is coming off later. So this shift in ice out has a strong effect on lake thermal stratification patterns here. And as a result, we've seen, again, thinking about pre, post, for this ice out comparison, we've seen some big changes in the algal communities across lakes here. These are data from 18 lakes across the region. And what we see is that there's an indicator species, Discostellus delidra, that flourishes when you have shallow mixing. And with that shift in ice out and subsequently shift in thermal stratification, we see a, a big change in the abundance of this species across the region. And interestingly, we've also seen a change in lake habitats. And that's what this diagram is showing you. This is the pelagic to benthic ratio for the entire algal community. Again, this is going across 18 lakes in the region. And what we're seeing is that with that shift to earlier ice out, we're seeing more and more benthic species. Waters are becoming clearer, and we're seeing a shift um, in algal species going from occupying more of the water column to many more in the benthos. And this has implications for nutrient cycling in lakes and also for food webs in these systems. So some interesting shifts that we've been seeing across this landscape. And so just to say um, for this latest part of the project, we saw numerous features that were responsive to rapid climate change in this region and we found surprisingly tight coupling of these responses to climate shifts. So we're in the process now of working on pulling this story all together to publish. And um, our next steps beyond that are thinking about possibly um, implementing some sort of an integrated monitoring network across this region. Everything we've done so far has been data, we're using data that were collected for other projects. And so we're trying to Think about some next steps where we actually plan something um, and, and um, develop a system where we can monitor change over time. And I will say as well that we're always interested in having new members as well. So if anybody's interested, please, please talk to me. Thanks. Point analysis is yeah. a new one to me. Can you describe a little bit how it works? <laughs> That's why we had two statisticians on the project. Um, but it's basically um, so it's a variation on linear regression that you're looking for. Um, you're basically looking for a shift in the averages over different time segments. So. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 